this. Last thing we talked about was electron configuration. And we talked about how um, atoms have different electron configurations based on uh, what we call the alpha-bile buildup. We talked about how every electron has a, a specific set of quantum numbers and all that good stuff. Um, so let, let's go through, talk about some periodic table trends, because this is important information that we need. And then we're going to, the last thing that we do is, is we're going to talk about uh, Lewis structures, because it's important and, and it's important to understand Lewis structures in terms of valence electrons and, and bonding. So we, the Lewis structures that we do are going to be covalent compounds, not ionic compounds. There are ionic compounds that you can draw Lewis structures for, but we're going to do it for uh, covalent compounds. So we're gonna, before we do that, we'll talk here about just different periodic table trends. And the first one, probably one of the most important trends <clears throat> is the trend for electronegativity, right? And that is <coughs> the tendency, excuse me, of an atom to attract and form bonds with electrons. So atoms that have high electronegativity, they have a really strong pull on another atom's electrons, right? Or they have a strong pull on their own electrons depending on what they are. And I, I'll give you an example of that. Um, but the trend is here. The trend is that electronegativity increases from left to right, and it also increases from bottom to top. So left to right across the, the periodic table. Uh, left to right across the periodic table and then bottom to top in a, in a given group. All right, so in a group, let's say for instance here, let's look at the halogens. Fluorine is actually the most electronegative atom on the periodic table. It has an electronegativity of uh, 4.0. 4. Oxygen is second most at 3.5, right? But if you look at, when we say bottom to top, fluorine is the most electronegative atom in this group. And then astatine, which is here, is the least electronegative. All right, so and that's in any group, bottom to top. So the least electronegative atom is gonna be at the bottom. The most electronegative atom will be at the top. Same thing for uh, this group, polonium is the least. And then oxygen is the most. Then if you compare and like, let's say if we compare to oxygen, right? It's increasing from left to right. So carbon is going to be less electronegative than oxygen if we're comparing from here to here, right? So we compare carbon and oxygen. Carbon is less electronegative than oxygen. If we compare carbon to silicon, which is underneath it, This is less, this is more. Again, bottom to top, it increases. Left to right, it increases, all right? Uh, so this is, and this is a very important, um, very important concept when you think about bonding, especially covalent bonding, because if you have two atoms and a bond, a covalent bond, let's say, uh, Let's say you have a bond between carbon and fluorine and it's covalent. This bond is going to have what we call a dipole. And the electrons, because fluorine is so much more electronegative, 
than carbon, the dipole is always going to face the more electronegative atom. Let's see, I'll just say favor. All right, so the dipole between two atoms that have different electronegativities, the dipole is always going to favor the more electronegative atoms. So if you look at the periodic table, carbon is less electronegative than fluorine. Uh, and so the dipole is going to be going that way. What that creates <clears throat> is polarity. So now carbon becomes partially positive and fluorine becomes partially negative. So in, the, in covalent bonds, you can have polar covalent bonds. If the dipoles, if the dipole is big enough, you'll have a, what's called a polar covalent bond. If it's, if it's a small dipole, then you have what's called um, a non-polar covalent bond. So it just depends. But, but I just wanted to bring that up because really when you talk about, when you get past g -chem and you start talking about organic and how reactions happen, really the electronegativity kind of dictates that. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna, let's move to the next trend, right? So electronegativity is left to right, bottom to top. The, another important trend is ionization energy. <laughs> That's the energy required to remove an electron from a, from a neutral atom, All right? Where do you think that electron is gonna come from based on what we've been talking about? Is it gonna come from the first subshell, or is it gonna come from like the outer subshell, the very last subshell, or the very last shell? in an atom. This would be the equivalent of saying, uh, taking um, calcium and making it calcium plus one. Where's that, elect that one electron gonna come from if I remove one electron from calcium? Where's, wh where do you think it's coming from? And considering the fact that calcium has 20 electrons total, is it coming from 1s or is it going to come from 3s or 4s one of those uh, shells in the outer region it's always the valence electrons there's always the electrons that are in the outer shell that get touched so anytime you make an ion where you take a atom and you either lose an electron or gain an electron, it's always going to be the outer shell electrons. It's never the inner shell electrons, always the valence electrons. All right. So the ionization energy, this is the trend. It, it mirrors electronegativity, right? It mirrors electronegativity. It increases from left to right, and it also increases from bottom to top. So left to right, bottom to top, it increases. It, it, you can think about this in terms of electronegativity too. Uh, the more <clears throat> electronegative an atom is, the less likely it is to give up its electrons. So it's harder to ionize an atom that, that is has a high electronegativity because the electrons are held a little bit more tightly to that atom. So you, that's why the ionization energy and the electronegativity kind of follow the same path because if you have a highly electronegative atom, that atom loves this electron. So it's not gonna be willing to, to just release them to any, you know, any other atom or become an ion readily, right? Because of the electronegativity. So it mirrors electronegativity in that 
the trend is left to right increasing and then bottom to top. So it takes more energy. Let me give you an example for, let's say, fluorine versus oxygen. It takes more energy to ionize fluorine than it would to ionize oxygen. All right, so if you look, if you compare fluorine and oxygen, fluorine ionizes slower than oxygen, basically. And so it'll take more energy to get that elect to eject that electron from fluorine's outer shell. All right. All right, let's go to the next trend, which is electron affinity. You can see this also kind of mirrors. Electronegativity is <laughs> the ability of an atom to accept an electron. And so if electronegativity is the ability of, of an atom's tendency to attract bonds or attract electrons to form bonds, you can imagine electron affinity is kind of similar because if you are attracting electrons to yourself, you're also, in a sense, accepting them. So it's the ability of an the affinity of an atom to accept an electron and, and the trend is the same, right? Bottom to top, left to right. So it also mirrors electronegativity. Right, so more electronegative atoms are more apt to accept electrons than less electronegative atoms. That's how you can think about this. So it also, or more electronegative atom I put easier in quotes so it, it'll, it's easier to accept a pair of electrons to an atom that's already electronegative so that's why you see that trend of increasing from left to right and increasing from top to bottom all right, and the last trend we're going to talk about here is atomic radius, which is basically um, it's a it's a not necessarily a measure of the size because you, it's hard to do that. But if you take two atoms and you put them together and make a diatomic, it's, it's basically the measure of half the distance between those two nuclei, right? <clears throat> so when we think about atomic radius. One of the things we have to think about is uh, the number of shells that an atom has, the number of electrons an atom has. Uh, and so when you think about this in terms of increasing atomic radius, right, it is the opposite of electronegativity. It's going, it's increasing from right to left. And it's also increasing from bottom to top <clears throat> in a group. Right, and if you notice like from bottom to top, what you'll notice is that you, you can see the like let's say for instance, if we compare lithium to cesium, look at the difference in atomic numbers. So lithium has three electrons, cesium has 55 electrons. So cesium has more shells, right? And because it has more electron shells, you can see that cesium is gonna be a little bit bigger because those shells are surrounding the nucleus. And the more shells you have, the further away from the nucleus the electrons are. So cesium is going to be, um, it's got 55 electrons. So that's, that's quite a few uh, subshells, right? Because you, as you can imagine, we would, when we were doing electron configurations the other day, even with calcium, 
we got all the way up to, let me see if I can find it right quick. Even with calcium, we got all the way up to, um, well, chlorine, we got up to 4S, right? And I think with calcium, we got up to 3P. And that was just with 20 electrons, right? So imagine 55, you have to go further down that alpha buildup. You're gonna fill up more shells. And so the more electron shells that are present, the larger the atomic radius is gonna be, right? And if, if you notice also atomic radius, the, the reason why it's increasing from right to left in this case is, let's think about this. If the electronegativity is the measure of an electron affinity, a measure of either being able to accept electrons or being able to pull electrons from another atom, right? That means that the atom itself, let's say for instance, fluorine, which is the most electronegative atom, the nucleus of the reason why the atomic radius for fluorine is so small is because the nucleus of that atom has more attraction to the electrons that are surrounding it. So they're held tighter to the nucleus. Right, so for atoms that are more electronegative, the electrons are held more tightly to the nucleus. And then as you go across from uh, left to right, electronegativity is decreasing. And so the atoms are held a lot less tight, tightly to the nucleus. And so the atomic radius kind of expands, right? The, the shells are a little bit further apart. The atomic radius expands. And so that's why it's increasing uh, from left to right. We can tie this back to electronegativity as well. All right, so you hold electrons a little bit less tightly to the nucleus, so the atomic radius is going to increase, going across from left to right. And then from top to bottom, it's the number of electrons. Right, more shells, larger atomic radius. Less electronegative, larger atomic radius. So that's how those, those are, are three periodic or four periodic trends that are very important. So electronegativity, ionization energy, electron affinity, and atomic radius. And they all play a, some type of role in determining how atoms react, right? All, that's why I, I introduced them because all of these have some role in how atoms react with one another, right? Uh, all right, any questions about that before we jump into these uh, Lewis structures? All right, so we're going to talk about um, Lewis structures from a covalent perspective. And, and if you watch that little video I sent you last night, uh, there are basically five steps to uh, building a Lewis structure. And this is important because it ties in now our knowledge of valence electrons and how many electrons are in the valence shell of a given atom. <clears throat> so here, the first step is to count up the number of valence electrons. And this is in the chat, by the way. Let me, let me upload it again for those who may have come in a little bit after I posted it. All right. 
right, I just uploaded the PDF and now I'll upload the Word document. Where is it? Come here. All right. So I both, both documents are in the chat now. So count the number of valence electrons. How do we know how many valence electrons a given atom has? What number on the periodic table tells us that? Is it the group numbers? The group number. So that's how we can tell. <clears throat> and so most of our, and, and these are, again, we're gonna write Lewis structures. Let me specify this for covalent compounds. Right? So we wanna write counter number of valence. Right, it says write a skeleton structure, but really what we're gonna do is just arrange the atoms, right? With the least electronegative element in the middle. That's how we know what goes in the middle. That, <coughs> there's, uh, there's one exception here, and that is hydrogen. Hydrogen will never be, even though it's less electronegative than everything on the periodic table, it'll never be a, a central atom. So hydrogen won't ever be a central atom. It's always gonna be on the outside. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, and this whole, this, all these pages, when I put the notes in Blackboard, they'll, they'll be there. Because I, I just combined this with the document we already been working on. So I'll up, when I upload the notes, all this will be there. All right, so you want to draw, kind of arrange the atoms with the least electronegative atom in the middle. Uh, and then you want to put a pair of electrons between the atoms to make covalent bonds. Remember, we talked about this way back at the beginning of the semester, that a covalent bond is a bond where electrons are shared between atoms, right? The, the other part is very important, right? It's when it says complete the octets, every atom, with the exception of a few, there's some exceptions, wants eight electrons. So it can mimic or mirror the, the noble gas that's in its, in its period. Right, and if we go back to the periodic table, these are our noble gases over here. Right, so all of these have eight, all your noble gases have eight valence electrons. All of them. That's why they don't react. That's why they call them noble gases because they don't do anything. They're kind of like royalty, kind of like the queen of England, right? Just show up at events, wave, and go back and eat 10 crumpets. That's it. No reactivity whatsoever. Um, so every all of your atoms want to mimic the closest noble gas in the group or in the period because periods go, from, go across and groups go down, right? So chlorine... It wants to mimic argon. Bromine wants to mimic krypton. Iodine wants to mimic xenon. And then at, uh, astatine wants to mi mimic um, radon and so on and so forth. Right? So, so that's really critical to drawing Lewis structures is to understand what we call the octet rule, which says that every atom wants to have eight electrons around it so, so that it can mimic the closest noble gas. Right, and then the fifth step, it says check that you only use the number of valence electrons in step one, which we're gonna do. And then it says, if not, uh, you may need to double, make need double or triple bonds. So we wanna make, cause sometimes you'll have atoms that don't have an octet. And so the way you uh, rectify that is to make multiple bonds, double bonds, triple bonds, so on and so forth. 
All right, so let's take a few of these down here. I want to start with this one. I'm going to start with C because this is going to be, out of all of these, this one is going to be the simplest to use to discuss the octet rule and all that. So we're going to start with that. Right, so we think about uh, carbon, tetrachloride. Carbon has four valence electrons. It's in group four. And then chlorine has, <coughs> excuse me, seven valence electrons, but that's going to be times four because it is CCL4. So it's going to be 28. And then carbon has four. So it's going to be a total of 32 valence electrons. All right, so then <clears throat> if we have 32 valence electrons, let's put in the carbon and let's put the chlorines around it like this. All right, and we said the carbon has, we're gonna put one electron here because we wanna make a, a bond between carbon and chlorine. And we're gonna put another one here, All right? And so you can see right away that carbon now has an octet. Each one of those bonds to carbon gives it, it's sharing two electrons. So this is two, four, six, eight. So carbon is, is good. It has, it has an octet and that's good. So now we can say that Carbon has an octet, which is great. Okay, so now we've used how many? Eight? We've got 24 electrons left. Right? And so when you have, since carbon has an octet and we have 24 electrons left, right, we're not going to make any more bonds. So these 24 electrons are now going to be what we call uh, lone pairs or non-bonding pairs. All right, so we're going to put those around chlorine. So we're going to do two, four, six, and we have four chlorine, so we can put six electrons around each one. So that's going to be two, four, six, two, four, six, like that, and then two, four, six, total, all right? And so now you can also see that chlorine has an octet, all right? It's got two, four, six, and then we can count these two in this bond for chlorine as well as carbon, all right? So chlorine also has an octet. Each one of them, have, uh, each chlorine has an octet. All right, so we followed, we followed every step. We counted the number of valence electrons. We built the skeleton where we took the carbon and put it in the middle and put the other atoms around it. <clears throat> and then we put a pair of electrons between the atoms to form bonds. And it gave carbon an immediate octet. Uh, and then we also put the rest of the electrons we use those as non-bonding pairs. So that's how we completed the octet step four for all of the atoms using the remaining valence electrons. So we took the uh, leftover electrons, we made non-bonding lone pairs around each chlorine. And then we used up, so we used up all 32 of those uh, valence electrons. All right, any questions about that? All right, let's talk, let's do uh, D. All right, phosphorus and bromine, let's look at the periodic table. Phosphorus is here, bromine is here. <clears throat> and electronegativity increases from 
left to right. So bromine is more electronegative than phosphorus. <laughs> that means that phosphorus is gonna be our central atom. So here we're gonna say P Br5. So P has five valence electrons. All right, and then bromine has seven. It's in group seven. Let's go back up to here. So nobody gets lost. A phosphorus is in group five. This is on, on the periodic table. The groups on this side, this is group three, group four, group five, group six, and group seven, and then group eight. All right, it's really 13, 14, 15, but we call it group three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So phosphorus is in group five, so that means it has five valence electrons, and then bromine is in group seven, so it's got seven valence electrons. And that's gonna be seven valence electrons times five, so that's 35 valence electrons. So we got a total of 40 electrons that we have to distribute. All right, so with phosphorus, let's see, let's put the put the uh, phosphorus in the middle. And it has two, three, four, five. Five valence electrons around it. And phosphorus is, in this case, you're gonna notice something about the octet. And that is that uh, phosphorus is gonna have an extended octet. Uh, it's not gonna be uh, eight electrons. It's actually gonna end up being 10. So let's see what happens. So that's five. And then let's put the bromines around it. Like so. And then we're gonna put in a, one electron each here to, to show the bonds between those. And let me go back up to here too, because you don't, you don't normally leave this like this. You'll write it like this. All right, so here, let's do the same. So that's now you see phosphorus has a, has 10 electrons around, it, but that's okay. Phosphorus is one of those atoms that can have an extended octet. It, it's a kind of, it's an exception to the octet rule. has what we call an extended octet. <clears throat> so that's one exception. There are a few others <coughs> um, that are exceptions to the octet rule, but phosphorus is one that is most certainly an exception. As you can see, it has now 10 electrons around it. All right, but we got it. We have to use what we have. So that's a total of, of 10 electrons. And then, so we're gonna subtract that out from here. So now we got 30 left. And we got five bromines. And if you saw, if you notice what we did with the chlorines, the fact that bromine and chloride are in the same group actually means something because they all do the same thing. So just like we put long pairs around chlorine, we're gonna do the same thing here with the bromine. We got 30 electrons and six bromines. So let's see what, what, we, what we can do with that. I'm sorry, five bromines. So three, that's six, 12, 18, 24, and 30, right? So we take those 30, we took those 30 electrons and we use them as lone pairs. All right? So we could actually write this out like this. And I'm gonna show you the, the geometry too. We have 
chromium here, 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 and here. Right. This this is a we have we're not talking about going to talk about Vesper uh, theory and geometries in depth, but this geometry is what you call a trigonal by parameter. Right. So it, and if we were to write this out, it would look like if we were to draw it flat, it the uh, P would be here in the middle, and you have bromines here, here, and here. And then you have one bromine above the plane and one below the plane. So those three bromines that are here are kind of, um, they kind of form like a triangle. That's the trigonal part. And then the bipyramidal part is the two bromines that are above the plane and below the plane. All right, questions about that one? <clears throat> All right, let's do B. Got four minutes left. B was BCO3. <laughs> so boron, let's go back up to the periodic table. Boron is in group three. Right. And so that means it has three valent. This is a boron is another exception to the octet rule because it doesn't need an octet. It's fine with having uh, six electrons around it and it doesn't need eight. Uh, so boron is group three. So let's and then chlorine is group seven. Right. Chlorine is a halogen. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, astatine. Those are your uh, halogens. So all of those are in group seven. So let's go back to here. And so boron is less electronegative. You see it's all the way to the left of chlorine. So we're gonna put that in the middle. Well, first let's tab up, tabulate our electrons. So B has three valence electrons. And then chlorine has seven valence electrons. So this is gonna be times three because you have three chlorines, so it's gonna be 21 electrons. So we got a total of 24 electrons. So let's see what we got. So we're gonna put in our boron and it's three valence electrons are here. And then for chlorine, we're gonna put that here around boron and we're gonna give each one of these an electron. Now we can't put any more electrons on boron. All right, so what we're gonna do is take what we have, because boron again is an exception, so it'll take six electrons, it doesn't need an octet. So this has, this is six, so we're gonna subtract that out. Minus six electrons, so now we got 18 electrons left. And we already know chlorine being a halogen, all halogens, when they make that one bond, unless they are in a bond with oxygen, which then you get some weird double and triple bonds or double bonds forming between halogens and oxygen and things like that. But if they're just in a bond with another non-metal that's not oxygen, right? They're gonna make one bond and have three lone pairs around it. Right, so that's that's the rest of my 18 <clears throat> electrons. All right, Qu any questions about the Lewis structures? They're not they're not that difficult to build as long as you follow the rules, and if you understand the octet rule. The octet rule. There are some exceptions. That's actually, uh, if you go to the website. Uh, Breslin.org. That's the guy who made the uh, Lewis structures video that I sent last night. 
there's a there's a short video, like a five minute video on exceptions to the octet rule. Uh, and boron and phosphorus just happen to fall in that category. But otherwise, every atom is going to desire to have eight electrons around. And you do have some exceptions where you have either extended octets where you got more than eight electrons around your central atom, or uh, you have an atom that doesn't need an octet. So it'll have, it might, it'll have less than eight. So boron is an example of that. But if you go to this website right here, breslin.org, there's a short video. I may just send it to you. There's a short video on uh, the uh, exceptions to the octet. It's like a five-minute video. All right, any questions? 